Good morning and or good afternoon, whatever time of day you might be looking at this. This uh, week is all about brain anatomy. Uh, the anatomy actually of the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system. The brain starts out to be more like the brain of a fish without a uh, without cerebral hemispheres and the lower brain of our uh, in our brain is all about automatic functions uh, the survival and uh, reflexes and things like breathing and uh, uh, things that we don't unconscious functions that we don't think about but that are necessary for life so if we're damaged uh, in a lower brain, usually that's death. And usually, quite often, and well, most of the time, it's instantaneous death. Whereas, if we're damaged in the higher brain, uh, this could be a little different. Okay, so it's all about location, location, location. And there are some resources, some video dissections that will help you. I have a couple. One of them is pictorial, and the other one, uh, there's a, a two part series here where the person does a pretty good job. Um, and I'll give you those links. One of the hardest things to uh, get your wrap your mind around is that in these ventricles in the brain, like the one here that is sort of collapsed, but that's these are lateral ventricles. There are two of them, and then the cerebral spinal fluid that's inside of those uh, flows down through the third ventricle and all the way down in this area to the fourth ventricle under here. And of course, if this brain were intact, if both parts were here, if the meninges were surrounding the brain were intact and the skull was there, this would be, a, this cavity would be filled with fluid, cerebral spinal fluid. Remember, we talked about those fluids a little bit. Basically, uh, cerebral spinal fluid leaks out of the capillaries in this ventricle, in each of these ventricles, the second, uh, the, the two lateral ventricles. And uh, it is plasma that then, uh, helps to circulate through the brain tissue and down through the spinal cord and back up. And then the, uh, the dirty fluid, uh, dirty plasma, basically with all the toxic chemicals in it, is resorbed in the uh, arachnoid space and arachnoid veins and gets back into your system where the, it can be detoxified. Now remember this, this location, location, location is related to function. And you remember we had a little introduction to Phineas Gage and the damage to his frontal lobes and how it affected his ability to control uh, certain uh, emotional responses and he became basically a different person. Well, when the higher brain is damaged, there can be survival and there can be restoration of function like when we see uh, a stroke or if we see actual physical damage and two of the most dramatic, uh, uh, two, two of the most dramatic uh, stories are about Jim Brady and Gabrielle Giffords. And you probably remember Gabrielle Giffords because um, she is the politician who was shot in the head during 1981, no, 19, 2011, 2011. And she has survived. Uh, but she will never be the same. She'll never fully recover. And you can look up plenty of things uh, on the web about her. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And then Jim Brady was shot. And this is an interesting one. This was 1981. And this happened when uh, in the assassination attempt on President Reagan. And of course, we all watch this on television. Um, and there's Jim Brady here in 2006. Like Gabriel Giffords, he recovered, he survived, but he did not fully recover and never was able to uh, restore his previous life, actually. But as a result of Jim Brady's shooting, there were a lot of calls for handgun control or gun control laws. And uh, we do now have a Brady bill and uh, uh, implemented in 1998. Uh, this is where you have to have a five day waiting period and certain people can have guns and certain people cannot have guns. And uh, so uh, I don't necessarily agree that that's right, but that's the way it is. And uh, 
So if if, if you are a, a member of any of one of these categories that's listed on this page, yeah, you're not allowed to have a gun. And if you're found with one, it's an automatic 18 months in the federal penitentiary. And it doesn't matter uh, what the circumstances are. That's just uh, sentencing guidelines. That's what will happen. So the federal marshals would show up and put you in custody and you go to federal court <clears throat> and then uh, you'll go to prison for 18 months. Okay, so that's the Brady Bill and interesting. Um, then chapter 13 is about some other things, but before we go on to that, um, I want to talk to you about methods used to study the brain. <clears throat> because you know from the um, you know from Phineas Gage that the study of physiological psychology got started because of his brain damage, but it started more than that. Um, there are a couple of facts about the brain that are interesting. Uh, one is that uh, it has no pain receptors. So if brain surgery is being done, it is often possible to keep the patient awake and to do some other playing around, for lack of a better term, uh, while a surgeon is doing what he needs to do there. And so uh, with the patient's permission, surgeons will do things like uh, take an electrical probe and stimulate specific parts of the brain to see what happens. In some case, uh, cases, a, a motor nerve uh, causes a response, maybe an arm lifts or a finger twitches or a toe twitches or whatever. And that maps the location of that function uh, in the brain. Or there are feelings. So a patient may be wide awake and talking and able to say, well, gee, uh, and, the, and of course the patient really doesn't feel anything, but the patient perceives things. So there's like a stereotactic machine that allows uh, the surgeon to uh, identify exactly that place. And he may have a little needle probe with an electrical uh, stimulation at the end and touch a part of the brain and the patient might say, oh, I see bright lights or I see stars or uh, I feel a tummy ache or whatever it is. And that's one way that surgeons uh, over time, the medical profession over time has mapped where so many of the brain functions occur. You couldn't do it with a dead specimen or a specimen from a dead person or a dead animal. You have to do it with a living animal. And uh, of course, I'm sure research has been done using living animals uh, to study brain function also, um, at least motor function, because it's pretty hard to talk to animals. Of course, uh, if, if you're, you know, Mr. Ed, maybe, you know that show, that's, most of you are too young to know about that show, but Mr. Ed was a television show about a talking horse, and the star of the show would go back in his barn and talk to his horse and so forth and so on. It was sort of interesting. Oh well. <laughs> Sometimes you probably see it on TV, it comes on old, old television and so forth, all right? So uh, that's that. And so you might read this, I'll give you this link also. Um, Finally, chapter 13, let's go back to the bookshelf, is about the peripheral nervous system. So chapter 12 is about the central nervous system, basically the brain and spinal cord. And then chapter 13 is about the peripheral nervous system. Um, these two chapters contain a tremendous amount of information and I don't expect you, I don't expect you to memorize it all and I know you can't, I can't. Uh, there's just so many different aspects. So you might find some that to you are more interesting than others. Uh, certainly we're all different. Um, one of the things that you might find interesting is the reflex responses. And uh, let's see, page 513. And your book has the reflex arc. Um,
the reflex arc. So there we go with the reflex arc. And the reflex arc is all about automatic things that happen. Uh, and the purpose of the reflex is so that the sensory nerve sees, hears, feels, whatever, uh, knows, perceives something, and uh, your body reacts out of fear, perhaps out of self-protection, uh, without having to waste time going to the central nervous system to integrate the information. It happens straight through the spinal cord. So it's in the spinal cord, out the spinal cord, to a part of the body that uh, can respond quickly. So fight or flight, part of that response is there and so forth. And uh, so this, this page is interesting and this aspect is interesting. And then another thing that I would uh, think you might be interested in is sciatica. Uh, as one of the peripheral nerves, as one of the peripheral nerves, the sciatic nerve is the one you hear for about a lot because it's the longest nerve in the body. And this is why you give a shot, for example, of, of an injection in the uh, gluteal, gluteus uh, medius and not in the gluteus maximus, so you do not hit the sciatic nerve. Many people have sciatic nerve damage, and um, many people have sciatic nerve damage that happens uh, because your nerve is pinched. And it hurts, I'm going to tell you. I have a friend who's had it. I've had it. I, I was on the floor for six weeks uh, doing work because I couldn't hardly walk. The pain was stabbing. It was horrible. And nothing I could take would stop it. And one day it went away. It just went away. The nerve relaxed. The muscle relaxed. That was putting pressure. And it just went away. Uh, but a lot of people have sciatica. And, uh, you know, I probably should have gone to a chiropractor or a doctor instead of suffering with it. But I suffered with it and walking was very difficult. It was very hard to do anything and it was tough. So that's of interest. You might want to read about that. And then finally, you can look at uh, Mr. Anderson. Where is Mr. Anderson? The sensory system. Because the sensations are part of this chapter. But as Mr. Anderson explains in this video that I will give you the link to, we have about 25 senses, not just five. We normally think of hearing, smell, taste, touch, and sight, those five things. But uh, what about the sense of balance, kinesthetic senses, and other? So think of the, uh, all the things you perceive that aren't related to motor function or the primary senses. The sense of balance, the fact that you're not dizzy all the time. That does have to do with the inner ear, but it's another sense. What about the sense of a geographic position? Some people are exceptional when it comes to knowing where they are in a landscape and the what direction things are. Um, that probably is something that you develop over time depending upon where you live. If you live near the mountains in Colorado, you always know which way is west because the mountains are probably west of you unless you're up in the mountains. So if you have reference points, you learn based on those. Other people learn based on the stars, um, but that's another sense is where you are, a sense of position, um, a perception of, of another person's emotions. Uh, something we call empathy. If you see uh, basically the communication on a person's face and in their gestures. So I'll give you a link to this video. Uh, Mr. Anderson's video does summarize most of the material very well and puts it in a perspective that I think is easier to understand and helps to integrate the topics that you've had uh, last week, this last week and that you're going to have this next week. So the function of the nervous system and the anatomy of the nervous system. And he, he puts it together in a pretty good way, I think. And especially for neophytes uh, that haven't seen uh, a lot of this before. And I'll consider myself in that group because I'm not a uh, brain surgeon expert. Um, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't spend a lot of time in this area, but there are certain subjects that do fascinate me with respect to how our brains work. Thanks and uh, enjoy. Uh, the week if you can, and don't uh, fret too much over all of the material. Thanks.